Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1987 film Street Trash. And if you've seen this film, it's a pretty notorious film for what it is. And uh, yeah, we're going to get into it. But let's not pretend this is some wonderful piece of cinema. Because I know there are people who are like, I love it. It's such a wonderful film. It's a fun film. Uh, in the way that it's just sleaze and ridiculousness. And it's not going to be for everyone. But uh, is it a great film? No, it is not at all a great film. Uh, there are good things about it. There are great things about it, actually. But I think it's, for me personally, I think it's a fun film. I have a good time with it. Uh, but, you know, you got to keep things in perspective, just saying. So here we go. Getting to Street Trash. Directed by J. Michael Murrow, uh, who's had a long career in film actually working in, camera, in the camera department for many, many films that you may know. I'm going to name... Uh, some of the big names that are not horror, but mainly just more of the horror ones. He worked on Spookies, by the way. I have a review for Spookies, as well as a, doc a review on the documentary about Spookies and some additional information that I got in an interesting way on Spookies. So I have basically three Spookies videos here, so you can check those out. Uh, he also worked on Brain Damage, Maniac Cop, Slime City, Friday the 13th 8, uh, Jason Takes Manhattan, The Abyss... Predator 2, and tons of huge non-horror titles such as, just for some examples, Titanic, Heat, and Terminator 2. The guy had a career. And I will say from a directorial standpoint, this film is good. You know, and cinematography-wise, it looks good. So there are some technical things in this film that really come together and work well. I'm going to throw on top of that the practical effects. Obviously, this film is known for the practical effects. I mean, obviously, it's mainly known for, like, the Technicolor melt scenes. Mainly the first one on the toilet. But there are great things about this film. There really are. So this was written by Roy Frumke, Frumkus, uh, who also wrote scripts for Document of the Dead. Yes, about uh, Night of the Living Dead. The Substitute, The Substitute 2, School's Out. And The Substitute 3, Winner Takes All. I didn't know there were more than one substitute films. Have I seen? I think I may have seen the first one. It's been a long time. So there actually is a documentary that came out in 2006 called Meltdown Memoirs, which is about the making of Street Trash. It features two deleted scenes in the film too, which may be a reason that people might want to check this out or just to figure, just to find find out the behind the scenes craziness of how this film all came together. That's why I want to see it. Uh, so the scenes that were cut out were a junkyard dance sequence, sounds fun, and a subplot that fleshes out the relationship between Fred and Bronson, which probably good that they didn't have that scene in there because do we need another subplot in the film? I would argue where there really are no real plots in the film or that it's just a series of a bunch of mini plots that aren't really plots. You know, there really is no plot to the scene. There aren't any, you know, lifelike characters. There aren't any characters that have any sort of development. And that's why I say, like, it's not a good film because the script is just, it's trash. The script is trash, really. It's just that visually and ridiculous, as far as visuals and ridiculousness, the film comes together for those reasons. So anyway, Vic Notto, who's the guy who plays Bronson in this film, said that uh, he did his acting basically scene by scene and he really didn't have any clue who his character was or what the film was until he read the script three months after the film had wrapped shooting. So whenever you watch this film, understand that when Bronson's on camera, he has no clue what the film is. He has no clue who his character is even supposed to be. He's just acting scene by scene with the lines that he's given. And it was three months later after wrapping shooting that he found out what the film was mind blown. That is insane information, in my opinion. Uh, Mike Lackey, who's the guy who actually played Fred, made this, the severed penis, the also very famous severed penis in this film, but he actually made three different size versions of that severed penis. Why? I don't know. Seems a little excessive, but they had names for each one of them. One was called the Pecker, one was called the Poker, and the largest one was called the Packer, which I thought that was funny. People should know that. The F word is spoken apparently 128 times in this film. That should come as no surprise to anyone because, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. The garbage truck Fred jumps into uh, in this film was actually used 
as a form of transportation to get some of the cast to the premiere of the movie. I think that's actually a really good kind of like, you know, marketing promo stunt to do. Uh, and also it was probably relatively cheap. I, am I wrong? I assume it was relatively cheap, but maybe it costs a lot to kind of rent a dump truck. Or maybe they owned it somehow. I don't know. Brian Singer, yes, the Brian Singer who did the film The Usual Suspects and has done so much more, was actually a production assistant on this film. He cut his teeth on street, street trash. I'm sure he doesn't really tell people about that. It's probably not something he likes to go into because it's not highbrow or anything, but that is history. And, you know, that's not totally uncommon. Uh, there have been things that have actually alluded to the fact that Wes Craven actually did pornography uh, before he got into um, film, and I, th I believe that Sean Cunningham actually uh, was was doing some directing of pornography before he got into like legitimate film. Just saying. So immediately with this film, they set up the atm atmosphere as an urban wasteland, and they really do that because you know like these boarded up buildings, they look crappy. There's trash all over in the streets, and it's kind of also the music kind of matches like a dystopian situation. So, I mean, really, that is the atmosphere they're going for. Everyone's terrible. Nothing is good. It really does seem like this urban dystopia for the entire film. And I feel like they set that up well in the beginning to create that atmosphere. They capture it quite well and give you the expectation of basically what it's going to be. And what it's going to be is everything's terrible. There's no good stuff in this. There's no good people in this. And it's just a series of crazy over-the-top stuff that goes down because it's a terrible situation. Uh, this film obviously presents a terrible characterization of people who are homeless. If it were actually made today, this would actually be very problematic. Now, this does point to something I talk about every now and then, which is I am of the opinion that films like this that aren't very PC are fine to watch because they were from a different time. And it's good to see that and understand how far we've come as a society and be able to look at that and think that was a different time. And back then, things like this were very much acceptable. So you can watch the film with that context. Now, if someone were to make this film today, I would say, that's not a good idea. You shouldn't really do that because we're past that at this point. It was already done, obviously, with Street Trash. So we don't really need to go there again. Now, that said, I actually think I would argue, and I was going to argue this later, but I'm going to argue it now because it seems like the time. I would argue that there should be a prequel to Street Trash, and it should be all about the Tenafly Viper and how that drink came to be. So you wouldn't really focus at all on the, the homeless aspect or any of the ridiculous characters or the depravity necessarily, but you just focus on the backstory of where did this Tenafly Viper come from because that's the most imp most important in a way, but most interesting aspect of this film. I think one of the big problems with this film for me personally is it doesn't seem like there's much of any like one focus. And that's why I was saying there's no real plot to the story or plot to the film. There's no like singular focus. And I think the singular focus should have been on the Tenafly Viper. Now, you could argue that it kind of is because it's in the beginning and then it plays a big part in the end. But it disappears at, for very long stints and really doesn't seem to, you know, get all that involved in the storyline of what's going on. It's kind of more like there's this ten of fly, fly viper and it melts people, but then there's, you know, all this drama with people who are homeless. You know, so I would I would just think that a prequel about the ten of fly viper would be very interesting and very cool and could be a great film actually. Uh, so the opening sequence of the film actually exudes crazy energy with some great 80s music. That's another thing. Like, it's not good music, but it's great 80s music. You know what I mean? Like, cheesy and ridiculous. And for people who are fans of 80s films, especially 80s horror, you probably like that type of music. Uh, th 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 oh, I, I needed to say about the Viper. I'm just going to call it Viper, not Tenafly Viper now. But the label's cool. I love how they design that label. Um... And like I said, I just want to know the origin of that one. And that's the thing. Like, watching the film, when you find out what this product is, like, you do want to know the origin of it. And there's nothing about that. Like, it, it's just like, just accept that this thing exists. It melts people. And we're going to see that happen. I mean, that's great in itself that all the melting happens. And I love how, in the end of the film, they go, like, all in on just killing as many people as possible 
with the Viper. I, I'm all for that. that. That's great in the film, but just wanted more about it. They do waste no time establishing Bronson as the main villain, and they tie his current state of being the villain into his situation from Vietnam and being messed up from Vietnam. And that actually is kind of a product of, you know, the 70s, basically, because that was a real thing. You know, people were horribly messed up because of Vietnam. So in a way, there kind of is a social commentary in this film. There is that theme of Vietnam destroying people's psyches, destroying who people are as a person. So I think that's really what's at play for Bronson in particular. Notice the Raimi-esque, fast-moving camera work during the Technicolor melt scene. Yes, the very first one that grabs everyone's attention, that everyone talks about. The Technicolor melt on the toilet where he's, you know, his bony hand that's, you know, the rest of his body has dropped off of is still holding the, the flusher. Um, just love how that scene plays out. It is amazing. But yeah, they have that kind of Raimi, like, fast-moving camera work towards the ground that kind of, like, comes up to it. That's got to be inspired by Ted Raimi. It's got to be inspired by the Evil Dead. I mean, obviously. And on that topic, really the melt scene is what put this film on the map. It truly is wonderful. And that goes to what I was saying about the practical effects being very good for this film. Very good. Wendy actually makes a distinction between runaways and bums with the brothers that she visits being Fred and Kevin. Now, Wendy is the woman who works at the... Um, at the junkyard for that really horrible boss. Uh, she, it doesn't make sense that she has interest in Kevin, really. I mean, it would make sense that she has, like, uh, she has a soft spot for Fred and Kevin because of their story, because of their situation. That's fine. But the whole, like, actual, like, sexual attraction with Kevin does not make any actual sense, really. Especially because Kevin seems to be way younger than she is. So that's weird as well, but this film doesn't go by any sort of conventions, obviously, because it's just sleaze. I mean, it's sleaze. I like the shot of the businessman's melting face while the people argue with the cop. It looks really cool. The one where the second person to drink the Viper and start melting when the guy like looks up and, and a big glob of him melting falls on his face. And then he's like running and then he's on the ground. But there's a really cool shot where it's showing like where his face is, where he's laying on the ground, and the sh the camera's behind and pointing up and showing all these people kind of like in a group arguing over his body, basically. I thought that was a really cool scene, and it kind of shows the ridiculousness of it, and kind of shows that people were more focused on arguing with each other than they were with this guy's needs and the fact that he was dying. <laughs> um, but that kind of sums up the world of street trash, honestly. Like, people don't really care about each other. It's just, it's a... Everyone gives everyone the proverbial middle finger, and they move on. That's how it goes. By the way, the toe popping off during the scene with the, the second guy who's melting, and then his goo drops on the businessman's face, they, they're showing his foot, like, while he's melting. Like, his big toe just, like, pops, and, like, stuff kind of, like, foams out. I like that part. It's pretty good. I like how the guy trying to steal the food, the guy who's like shoving all the raw chicken into his pants, puts a bag on his head, puts a, pla a um, paper bag on his head before he then walks through glass and breaks it. I just thought that was kind of a weird choice. I guess he was just putting it on his head to like protect his face from the glass, but I, it's just weird. It's a weird thing. But that whole scene in general is kind of weird and kind of racist actually um, in a, quite a few aspects, but... Once again, it's 1987 and it was street trash. We don't ask questions. Take note that the doorman at the restaurant in this film, that's the scene where um, Fred has picked up that drunk woman and he walks past the restaurant. The doorman there witnessing that is James Lawrence. That's the actual actor who uh, is of Frankenhooker fame. Now, Frankenhooker came out three years after Street Trash, and I'm wondering if Hen and Lauder saw James Lawrence in Street Trash and decided to cast him in Frankenhooker. Uh, but Lawrence, James Lawrence is my favorite part, uh, other than the melting, he's my favorite part of Street Trash, uh, especially the post-credit, well, during credit scenes, I guess, that are intercutting between the credits and, and the actual scenes. Uh, he's great. Um, he His acting just outshines everyone, really. Uh, I, th I think he does an excellent job. 
but because he's in this, I actually really like to think that this film, that Street Trash is in the same universe as the Henenlotter films, because Frank Henenlotter's already said that all the all of his movies are in the same universe, like Frankenhooker, Brain Damage, and all three of the Basket Cases are in the same universe. So since Lawrence is also in Street Trash, I like to pretend that Street Trash is in the same universe as all the Henenlotter films, which if you stop and think about that, that creates some cool visuals and cool ideas. Just saying. The rape scene is shot like a nightmare with the guys like animals. I know a lot of people comment about the rape scene. Once again, this is one of those things where it was definitely a more accepted thing for people to be putting in film back then. Um, it's still being done nowadays. A, a lot of filmmakers will do it a lot more tastefully. And I think it only is really warranted when it's actually really a part of the story. Other than that, if you're just putting it in there to up the ante to someone being a worse person, you don't have to go that far. You don't really have to do that to show that someone's a bad person. Uh, I think it's it's a cheap way to get there. It's kind of like the old trope of, you know, if you really want to pull at someone's heartstrings, just show how they have a good relationship with their child. You know, it's just, yeah, laziness in my opinion. But you can tell they were trying to be as awful as possible with the junkyard owner having sex with a dead body. Yes, the guy commits necrophilia. I was surprised, actually, that he they didn't show that, to be honest, because at this point, you know, you're street trash. You're already doing what you're doing. Why didn't you even go that route? I mean, I'm glad they did not, but I'm, I was also surprised that they, you know. And I'm, I'm saying this from the standpoint of when it was the first time I watched it, which has been many years ago, at least five or six years ago, um, was the first time. I've seen it a few times since. And I know Joe Bob Briggs covered it as well with The Last Drive-In. But uh, that's followed by the severed penis gag, actually. The, the fact that you find out, or it's alluded to the fact that the junkyard owner has had sex with the dead body of the woman who was raped. Uh, then the penis gag happens where the penis is cut off and then it's, you know, people are basically throwing hot, playing hot potato with, with the severed penis, uh, which I wonder which one they went with, the pecker, the poker, or the packer. I didn't get that information, so I don't know. Put your guesses in the comments which one it is. It looked like it was probably the medium-sized one, the poker. I don't know. Who knows? But uh, one of the weird things about that scene, one of the weird things, one <laughs> many weird things about that scene, but one of the weird things about that scene is that the guy whose penis has been severed doesn't act like that happened to him basically he, like he acts just like oh my gosh like it's this this kind of just like wackiness but that's something that just kind of permeates the entire film honestly and I think that's one of the reasons that a lot of like the depraved schlocky sleazy things in the film play lighter than they actually otherwise would be is because a combination of how they shoot it shoot it how it's acted and how the music is makes it more seem just, like, over-the-top and wacky as opposed to, like, just disgusting and wrong. You know what I mean? Put some comments down there if you feel me. And even if you don't, actually. There are so many random characters popping up that you don't know which way they're going to choose to go with the film. And they kind of go every way with the film, like I was saying. Like, they'll just focus on, okay, well, let's just follow this character for a while. Okay, well, now we'll just follow this character for a while. Like, it's a very aimless-type film, uh, and for that reason, I mean, it's kind of fun, but at the same time, it also has a tendency to drag a bit because of that aspect as well. Just saying. Most people probably thought the cop would end up living in this film, but oh no, not in a dystopian wasteland film. And not in Street Trash, of course not. I mean, typically, especially in the 80s, the cop would end up living. I mean, how many films are there where the cop doesn't live, especially when he has been focused on a decent amount? And he's trying to do something good. You know, that just hammers home the fact that nothing good happens in Street Trash in, the, in this town, really. Except, I guess, Kevin Kevin lived in the end and beat um, Bronson. But st still, things are terrible. The guy exploding really is a great part. Um, the the large guy who, who found the, the Viper. It, and I like the kind of like the long shot that they do of him up against the wall, just kind of like sitting there and then he's just growing, growing, growing and he explodes. And apparently during that scene, uh, some of the stuff that explodes out of him, if you really look clo closely, 
they had had one company that was willing to sponsor them basically for it. And it was like a cake company. It was like a cake or donut company. So they had like so much of that on set. So they actually threw a bunch of that into that scene. So when the explosion happens, there's actually cake in there. So look for that the next time you watch it. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to say again, the Viper should have been the point of the film. I do like that they go heavy on the melt deaths at the end. I already basically said that. It is fun. It kind of brings you back to having a good time and kind of upping the ante. Uh, just as Wynette gets the courage to stand up to Bronson, the Viper does her in. Once again showing that good things don't really happen in Street Trash. Wynette finally gets the, the gall, the courage, and she stands up to him and then Viper kills her. The end with Bronson chasing Kevin is actually boring since everything prior is way crazier and Kevin wasn't even developed as a character. Yeah, I did care about Kevin, really. I don't think they set him up to be all that sympathetic. They didn't develop him. He wasn't a very good character. Uh, his relationship with Wendy didn't really make a whole lot of sense. And, and all the melts that they have going on before that scene where Bronson's chasing Kevin through the junkyard... Those are all way better, faster paced, more interesting. And then I just feel like it kind of brings the film down. Until the moment where that canister goes and hits Bronson and takes his head off. And then you see his head laying on the ground as his mouth's still moving. It looks great. Did I say the practical effects on this were really good? Because they're really good. I'm sure everyone watching this agrees with me. I'm preaching to the choir on that one. The scene during the credits is great because of James Lawrence. It's basically like at the end of the film, he's stealing the film. I'm just saying, is anyone else with me on that? Put some comments down there. Is James Lawrence not the best part acting wise of this film? I think he does. And that's why I'm glad that they finished the film with him. It made me stick around for the credits. The t cinematography is actually good considering how little people think of this film. I think it does look good. Uh, there certainly are pacing issues, which I think stems a lot from there not really being a plot and the just aimless depravity of the film in general. It just happens. That's what the film is. I remember the 80s and 90s and the atti attitude towards people who are homeless was that they were in that position because it was all their fault. Uh, it was very common for people to yell things like, get a job. So... Um, this film back then was not all that shocking. A lot of people had very poor attitudes towards people who were homeless. And, you know, there are plenty of people who still do nowadays, but it is much better than what it was. So for that reason, that's why I say that, you know, a film like this is one of those films that you look at and think about the context of those times and how this was just like, oh, it's schlocky, it's depraved. People weren't upset back then when this film came out about the depiction of people who are homeless. They were just upset about, you know, the grossness of, of the people melting and, you know, the the um, the language that was used, that this fact that the F word was used 128 times you know, and the violence, you know, those were the things they were concerned about, not the depiction of people who are homeless. But we've come a long way and this film definitely shows that. So it's good to watch films like this to, uh, you know remember how far we've come but it's also good to watch films like this because let's be honest it's just fun to kind of turn your brain off every now and then and just watch some crazy stuff like street trash yeah so with that said um it's kind of hard to rate this film so i'm going to rate it two ways i'm going to do out of five stars with half stars in play i'm going to do it as as an actual like film in the entire pantheon of films where does it rate and for that one i would say one star <laughs> one star and I give it I give it the one because of the way it looks visually and the practical effects and James Lawrence now as a so bad it's good film though I'm gonna go all the way to a between three and a half and four I'm gonna I'll, I'll go four I, I I will go four because it is crazy it's up there definitely so yeah a one as an actual film a four as a so bad it's good film but anyway I would love to hear your opinions on Street Trash. Go ahead and put them in the comments. We'll talk about them, get geeky. Uh, also, do me a quick favor and hit the subscribe button because that's your way to repay me. If you like this video or any video I've ever done, 
that is your best way to do it. It literally takes you a second and it means a lot to me and the growth of this channel and the growth, honestly, of this nerdy horror community I'm trying to build through my channel. So uh, I would appreciate that. Also hit the notification bell button because that way you'll know whenever new videos are coming out, whether it's one of these review videos or an unboxing or a haul or one of my opinion videos, any of that stuff. But regardless, thanks for taking the time to watch this. And until next time, keep it brutal.